I'm going to, uh, I'm going to begin introducing our archaeological panel today. Um, as was mentioned during lunch, uh, this has become national news uh, after uh, the press release went out uh, from NRG about three days ago. At least some newspapers picked up on it, uh, most notably the Dallas Morning News, and a, I must say a really smart reporter uh, who deserves some credit, Elizabeth Souder, S-O-U-D-E-R, uh, who spent a lot of time uh, interviewing people and getting the story straight and not, uh, she's the business, she's the energy reporter for the business section of the Dallas Morning News, but she's also a native Texan and a history buff, and she really took a very great personal interest in this story, and I think uh, she's one of those really good reporters who, uh, who does a great job and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and takes her work seriously. Uh, and, w and I think all of us are in her debt who are up here on the, uh, up on the stage today because she's helped to get this uh, story uh, uh, into the national news. It was picked up by the AP, and I think uh, uh, more media may pick it up as time goes, uh, as time goes by. Um, I have a personal relationship with some of the people on this team. Uh, uh, Greg Demick uh, and I go back further than either one of us would like to admit. Uh, back before he taught himself Spanish, back before he uh, uh, wrote all those books, uh, back when he was just beginning to be serious uh, about some of this stuff. And uh, Manuel Hinojosa, too. Uh, I remember one time in particular uh, when the History Channel decided to come along. I think this is actually what saved Greg's marriage. Um, uh, because <laughs> Debbie was getting really ticked off about him spending not only, you know, seeing 40 kids a week, or no, it's 40 a day, uh, or something like that in his pediatrician's office, but spending every spare moment in the muck. Uh, she was beginning to kind of doubt his commitment there for a while uh, as he was going out into the mud every single day, and, 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 and just as she was about to give up on him, Along comes the History Channel and makes him a TV star, and his, and his local Whartonites began to think, well, maybe he's not crazy after all. <laughs> uh, and so with, with, uh, with, with Manuel and me and several others along, Terry Keeler, I think, is here today, um, we went out with the History Channel and did a little 10-minute uh, This Week in History. And the thing I remember most about that, because it was a very blustery December day, is actually watching a barbecue sandwich fly through the air uh, <laughs> at lunchtime. Uh, well, let's get serious now that people are, are making their way in. Um, we're, I'm just going to introduce uh, each member of the team uh, in order as they, as they come up, rather than go through the whole list. Uh, Doug Mangum is going to be the first one to speak. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that he's working on his uh, PhD in cultural history, looking at uh, uh, social networks and American expansionism in the Old Southwest. Anyone who begins to dig into American expansionism in the Old Southwest begins to understand just how important these personal networks are. It's a small world in the 18 teens and 20s and 30s. And sometimes, like today, who you know is just as important as what you know. Uh, and I hope, to, I hope to read that before long. Right now, Doug, as is befitting someone Douglas. of his... Uh, Douglas. Douglas, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Uh, I'm a lot closer to Greg and Manuel than I am to some of these other people. Douglas, um, as is befitting of someone of his age, that is a lot younger than me, uh, is, a, is, is, is into uh, computer work. Uh, and you're going to see some of the results of that. Uh, uh, he maintains the computer mapping database for this entire project. He uh, uh, works for uh, Roger Moore's outfit. If you haven't seen Roger Moore on TV lately, you've really missed something. If you haven't seen Jan DeVault on TV lately, you've really missed something. Uh, uh, on Channel 13 the other night at 6.30. Um, Douglas has participated in a number of archaeological projects. Uh, is this your favorite one so far? Uh, yeah, yeah, he had to say that. Uh, it is. <laughs> Uh, and so, with a great deal of enthusiasm, Douglas Mangum is going to tell you what he's been up to out at San Jacinto. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, 
I'm as close to the mic as possible. Okay. They'd ask me to say. I'm going to be covering a lot of ground in a relatively short amount of time, so uh, I guess just hold on. Uh, I'm going to do a brief review of earlier projects that we've done out at San Jacinto, and then I'll discuss the reasons and the methods behind the current work that we're doing out at the NRG property. For the last six years, more archaeological consulting has been working with Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Friends of San Jacinto Battleground, the Texas Archaeological Stewards Network, and a large number of volunteers who uh, I can't say enough about uh, to conduct archaeological investigations in and around the San Jacinto battlefield. Initially, the work involved examining soil within the park and traditional locations of the Mexican camp to see if there were battle-related artifacts uh, still in the park. We began work in 2003 with an examination of the depth of fill within the park. Uh, we utilized augers and backhoe trenches to do this work. Uh, we checked the soils with metal detectors as we went along uh, on the off chance that uh, a small excavation unit, relatively small excavation unit like an auger or a trench would happen to stumble upon an artifact. Uh, a total of 76 augers and 35 trenches were dug during this period. And uh, you, you can see on the upper left is a map of the location of these trenches and these augers. Because of this work, we were able to determine that some of the locations within the park have artificial fill soils overlying the natural soils. And this, it helps us to know this because uh, if there's a certain level of, of fill, then often the metal detectors simply can't reach the natural soils to detect them. With this information, we were able to develop a map uh, with the depths of these soils. You see that in the lower right, uh, sort of a reverse topo map showing the, the depths of those fills and the locations. It's not complete, but it, it was as much as we could do. Uh, we also recovered one button, just by chance, uh, that may or may not have been battle-related. It, it's probably period, but determining whether it's, it's battle-related, we just couldn't really do. The next step was to conduct a metal detecting survey of the Mexican camp area to see if battle-related artifacts remain there. Uh, work on this step again in 2004, and uh, immediately we recovered a, a surprising number of battle-related artifacts. Uh, we used methodology that had been developed by previous uh, battlefield archaeologists, uh, right back to uh, progenitor Doug Scott, who, as you know, couldn't make it today. Um, also, we made sure that our methodology fulfilled the requirements of Texas Parks and Wildlife and the Texas Historical Commission. One of the most important factors in this work and in all of the archaeological work out at the San Jacinto Battlefield was the use of a total station and a geographic information system software to record the location of artifacts with a high degree of precision and accuracy. This allows us to look for patterns within the distribution of artifacts in hopes of seeing troop movement or other conflict indicators. And you see here a result of, of this work. Um, and here are just a, a series of images of some of the artifacts recovered from the Mexican camp. Most of these have been displayed before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. There are a rough total of, of 250 battle-related artifacts, as well as a number that we're less sure of, may or may not be battlefield-related. Um, in the upper, the upper middle is a, a group of musk balls, and uh, that really was the main item that we have found. Uh, makes up the, the vast bulk of, of the battle-related artifacts. However, we've also found gun and uniform parts, personal items, and artillery shot fragments, which, going back a bit, uh, here you see uh, two canister bases from a type of a shot used in cannons to basically turn them into a shotgun. Here you see uh, an example of the importance of documenting the artifact locations within a, a GIS system. An examination by Doug Scott was able to determine which of the musket balls had been fired and which had been dropped, and 
We were then able to display these within the GIS system over various maps uh, to look for patterns. And as you can see, the, the, pardon me, the red balls are the ones that were dropped and the blue are ones that were fired. And you can see that there was a, a very small number of fired versus dropped. And so the, the real question is what does all this mean? What did all it, all of it mean to us as archaeologists and historians? First, we determined that there, were, that there were indeed numerous artifacts still on the battlefield. And this in spite of the fact that some of the areas had clearly been impacted by prior construction and also by undocumented collecting. Second, uh, we determined that it's likely that we've yet to find the precise area of the, the main conflict of, of the battle. Uh, simply put, there were too few fired balls to suggest that we were right where the, the main conflict occurred. Third, uh, we determined based on, uh, based on these canister bases, uh, they are a type that was not used by the Mexican army at this time. So they had to be American, and from the radius, uh, we were able to determine that the twin sisters were six-pounder cannons. And also because we were able to plot these locations so accurately, uh, and we know within a, a certain range uh, how far such a, a canister base would travel after being fired, we know that these are within 150 yards or so of where the twin sisters, at least one of them, actually fired from. Finally, uh, we determined that more needs to be done. Uh, it looks like a, a fairly large area of coverage, but in fact, there's, there's still a lot of gaps in the coverage. The, the success of this initial work led to further investigations, including the, the next step of looking for the retreat of the Mexican army along the edge of Peggy Lake. And uh, this is a map of the, the location. Investigations at Peggy Lake began in 2005, and after five days of field work and a, a lot of days of hand clearing of, of the property so that we could do that work, we had found all of 27 battle-related artifacts. Uh, by comparison, as I said, we found 250 in the Mexican camp area. And the problem is not even all of these are we certain are battle-related. So many of them were musket balls, and this same location is, uh, was also the location of three 19th century homesteads. And simply put, musket balls are musket balls. It, it could just as easily be a local hunter. Um, but we did have at least two, two items, two cartridge box buckles that are identical to ones that we had been finding in the Mexican camp area. And so we know from that that we have a tie-in. And so what did this mean? This, this confirmed the presence of at least some Mexican soldiers retreating along the edge of, of Peggy Lake, as the, the accounts suggest. However, it also suggested that there were not many of them or that they were not dropping many things at this point or that they simply didn't have much to drop by this point. Other recent investigations that we have been directly or indirectly involved in include an electromagnetic and ground penetrating radar survey and associated ground truthing within the Texan camp area. We also conducted a day of investigations within the Texan camp area. Uh, Dr. Everett, uh, who is a geology professor at Texas A&M, conducted an investigation of the Mexican camp area using a machine called the EM-63, which is a, a much more complicated form of electromagnetic survey. And uh, we ground truth that also. We spent a single day doing a, a, a rather fast and dirty reconnaissance of some of the prairie areas south and southeast of the Mexican camp area. And finally, Dr. Everett uh, conducted a, some additional work with the M63 machine uh, south of the Mexican camp area. And uh, A&M doctoral student Dana Peterman is currently conducting some excavations to ground truth his results there. The total results from all of these more recent investigations uh, are relatively limited. 
there were only uh, two battle-related artifacts that came out of the, the prairie reconnaissance, only a handful out of the Texas camp work, and uh, nothing as yet from the most recent EM-63 work. Uh, these finds suggest several things, uh, that there are still artifacts in the Texan camp, and that these may include some items from the Mexican prisoners, because we, we did have an additional Mexican coin and a stirrup that was at least suggestive of being of Spanish or Mexican origin. And uh, it also suggested uh, there, was a, uh, there was an item or two found as a result of the initial EM-63 work that suggested that the main conflict might be further west than we've been looking so far. It also suggested that the conflict does not appear to have been intensi intensive to the south in this, this area, uh, because we've found very little at all, if, if there was anything, we either missed it, uh, which is possible because we were going fast, or uh, it's too deep. Uh, and finally, the, the EM-63 work, uh, here you actually see Dr. Everett uh, trailing his EM-63 machine across the surface. Uh, we were able to determine that uh, the M63 kind of has a hard time finding small items. It's, it's very good at finding large items, but uh, we actually tested it against a musket ball in, in the ground and just couldn't find anything. However, uh, all of this work is still preliminary. So at this point, I, I wanna mention, uh, as, as Jeff did during the, during the lunch, the importance of old maps and old aerial photographs to our investigation. Uh, we've learned a lot from these sources. Uh, for instance, the Yoka map that, that Jeff mentioned uh, from 1856, we dis discovered that uh, it is actually quite accurate. And uh, we've been able to put that in tandem with this 19, <coughs> pardon me, 1930 Tobin aerial photograph to get a, a better understanding of what the landscape and the tree lines and such of the battlefield probably looked like in 1836 at the time of the battle. We've also been able to use this 1913 Corps of Engineers map, which uh, they spent months m putting together and surveying. Uh, it's, it's really the earliest accurate topographical map of the battlefield. So our, our examination of these maps helps us to better understand what has happened in the battlefield since the battle? What, what occurred that has impacted it in one way or another? Including, uh, we were able to develop this map. It's, it's unfortunately very hard to see on this screen, but this shows us areas that, are, that have been impacted by construction since the, since the battle. And has given us, uh, we've been able to use this map to give us a better idea of where to dig and where to avoid digging. And uh, the Yoka map has also given us a suggestion of where the battle activity may have occurred. So, finally, moving on to the current work. Uh, this is a, a map of the general area of the, the NRG tract. Uh, you can see it's a considerable distance from the main battlefield. Um, so you might ask, why did we go there? Unfortunately, Jeff already answered my rhetorical question uh, during lunch, but uh, we had some good advice that, that, there was, that there were items out there in spite of the fact that it's so far from the main park, in spite of the fact that our work at Peggy Lake had so, so few results, um, we decided, okay, well, let's go ahead and do it. And uh, though the work, Though the work began in uh, 2008, it's, it's actually 2000, late 2007, early 2008, uh, it's important to note that uh, it happened because of a lot of work that went on before that, and that included the Friends of the San Jacinto Battlefield applying for an American Battlefield Protection Program grant and getting it, thankfully, and also because of the cooperation of NRG. Uh, which literally we could not have done this without their cooperation, but they have gone above and beyond the call in that cooperation to, to help us do this work. This is uh, the, the tract over an older aerial, f uh, older topographic map, and this is the project area over that same 1930 Tobin aerial photograph. 
And this actually turns out to be quite important later on in our understanding of the battlefield. This is a close-up with a, a pretty recent, I think it's a 2003 or 2004 aerial photograph. And as you can see, it's, it's a pretty heavily overgrown area, not to mention it's also 50 or 51, 51 acres in size. And we quickly realized that there's simply no way for us to uh, <coughs> go and, and dig the whole thing. So we determined to use a sampling methodology. And, and that was to cut a series of five lanes through the woods and sample, just check where we could, what we could get to with the, the amount of money that we had. To do this, we used a, a rather impressive machine called a wood gator. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> seeing it in action, I'd hoped to, to embed some video on this, uh, but I, I was unable to get the technology together. Uh, but. It, this machine is, is uh, our new best friend in, in areas like this. Uh, it's, it is able to cut trees up to five inches in diameter and yet cut down to the ground without impacting the ground itself. And uh, just makes the work that we do uh, ever so much easier. Once that was done, we uh, kind of went into regular archaeology mode. Teams made up of archaeologists, uh, archaeological stewards and metal detectorists work together to find a potential hit. Once a, a hit is found, they dig together with a combination of shovels and, and smaller hand tools. And then if whatever the hit was turns out to be battle-related or potentially battle-related, it is uh, recorded in detail uh, and uh, we shoot it in with the total station. And usually at the end of the day, we download that and make sure everything came out right. After we surveyed the five lanes, uh, this is what we found. It's, uh, again, a little hard on this image, but what we ended up with was two clusters of artifacts in lane two and lane three. Now, we think that there might have been stuff in lane, at this point we were thinking that there might be stuff in lane one that we missed because of the proximity to high, very high tension power lines, uh, which affect the, the ability of the metal detectors to, to do what they need to do. Um, this is a, a better map, but we, Pretty early on, we, we began to, to sus suspect that uh, rather than simply being two clusters, that these might be two representatives of a, a larger uh, artifact assemblage. And so we did some hand clearing uh, in, in areas that weren't terribly overgrown and conducted some more uh, excavations and added, I'll kind of go back and forth so that you can see added a considerable number more artifacts, which strengthened our belief that uh, we were talking about a, a, a formation of artifacts rather than just two clusters. And that led us to the, the decision to go ahead and cut something we called a zipper, which was a, a sampling lane which went back and forth across and beside. This was sort of the, the dual uh, effect of helping us fill in some of the gaps and also making sure that the, the linearity of artifacts didn't actually expand to the north or to the south. And this is what we found. Again, I'll, I'll go back and forth. And at this point, you can see we've, we've pretty much filled in most of the gaps in what we now knew was a line of artifacts. It's a uh, roughly 180 meters, or I guess that's about 190 yards long, by about 20 meters, 22 meter, uh, 22 yards wide. Oops, sorry. And uh, based on that work, we decided it would be a good idea to go in and try and clear as much of it as possible. And so we proposed to, to dig what we call the swath, where we use the, the wood gator to simply cut open the whole area. As, as much as we felt that we could. And here are some of the results. Here are some of the things that we have found. I'm 
not going to go into much detail about these because uh, my co-presenters will be dealing with the artifacts more directly, but I will say that we found, during this stage, we found 443 clearly battle-related artifacts and uh, a lot less trash than we usually do when we've been working in the main park. Um, there were a lot of personal items, uh, but also uh, many more uniform items, uh, many more uh, gun elements, such as initially five more bayonets, and uh, most, uh, most excitingly to us, it doesn't look like much, but this lower right item, once we got it back to the lab and looked at it, we realized that there was actually small swatches of cloth embedded within or attached to small bits of copper. And apparently uh, the copper, as it, as it uh, sits in the soil and gets wet, it actually generates chemical properties that, that preserve the cloth. And so what we're looking at is small swatches of Mexican uniforms. And uh, we, we haven't gotten to do much with them yet. We've only recently got them back from conservation. We're hoping to find somebody who, can, who has the expertise to look at them and tell us more about what it's made of and uh, maybe where it was made and what methodology was used. So, uh, more recently, just at the beginning of this year, we went ahead and cut the swath that we had proposed last year and went out and did some more excavations. And you can see we expanded and filled in the, the line of artifacts quite a bit. And uh, we had spent, we spent four days doing this. Uh, again, the bulk of the artifacts was was made up of musket balls, uh, but other artifacts were recovered, many of which we simply haven't had time yet to recover. There are a few of the conserved ones and uh, some of the as yet unconserved ones in our, in our uh, display case in front, which hopefully you guys will have plenty of time to take a look at later. Um, but perhaps one of the most important things that we realized when we started looking at the, the layout of the artifacts against some of the older maps. We went back and looked at the 1930 aerial photograph and we realized that the alignment of artifacts follows the old tree line of the natural tree line of uh, a large mod of trees that's been growing there for who knows how many centuries. Uh, it's, if you go back, you can see now the whole area is covered by Chinese tallow, which will pretty much grow anywhere. But in the natural state, this is what it looked like. And the artifacts align right along the edge of the tree line. And I'm gonna leave it to Roger to discuss uh, more detail about what we think that means. Um, now, before I close, I would like to extend our appreciation to the many, many volunteers and, and uh, not so much volunteers to NRG, to too many people to name. Uh, so rather than try and name them all in the time I have, I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, I want to note that the work of understanding the archaeology of the battlefield or if even this particular site is far from complete. Uh, there are ongoing investigations of the artifacts we've recovered, and we will be spending more time on the battlefield in the months and years to come, at least we hope. Uh, as usual with archaeology and historical uh, investigations, the story is simply still being written. Thank you.